Hey, Pastor Nick here. Before I jumped into the message, I just wanted to take a couple minutes to see how you're doing um, specifically in your prayer life. I, I know that it can be difficult sometimes to maintain that kind of steady communication with God. Sometimes we forget to talk to Him even. It's, it's understandable. You don't physically see God, and yet we see His hand on our lives all around us. But do you take the time to thank God? Do you take the time to, 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 to leave your requests before Him? To, to drop off your cares and your concerns and your worries and leave them at the foot of the cross, at the feet of Jesus? God wants to have that open dialogue with us, that conversation, that, that, uh, that point of connection with us. Because God loves you and because God wants to hear from you. And he wants to talk to you as well. Take those moments, take those times, even take a few moments right now, maybe pause the video before the message and spend a few moments in prayer with God. I know at times I forget to, and then at times I feel overwhelmed and that seems like that's all I do is just constantly spend moments in prayer with God. Take that time, spend time in his word, reading the scriptures, because in the scriptures we find the keys to life. In the scriptures we find who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and what he's doing today. As we see how Jesus lived in the, in the time of the Gospels and his life here on earth, we know what to look for when we see him at work in our world today. So my hope for you is that you would have a, a rich life of prayer and studying scripture and that these few moments where you listen to me go on and on about the scriptures would just be a small part of your devotion that you have to God. So I invite you to take a few moments now to pray. I wanna open up the scriptures to you today and talk about things that own you, things that, um, that, that maybe have possession of your life. There's a story here in Luke 18 of a man who had an encounter with Jesus. And over the next three weeks as well, we're going to be looking at some encounters with Jesus that different people had. Not necessarily where there was somebody that was healed or, or some miracle that happened, but just a, a conversation, an encounter with Christ, and how people came away from that. Some went away better and some went away because of their own actions like this man, worse. So let's, let's look into it, but what it ends up being is this man, he, he thinks he's coming to Jesus to find out about life. And Jesus pinpoints that one thing that the man thought that he owned, but it turns out that thing owned him. In this story, we're going to look at the, the, um, the Gospel of Luke, but it's also included in the other two Gospels that are part of what's called the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, John kind of writes from his own perspective at times, and so John doesn't always include the same stories that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. In fact, very few times does John have the exact same material. But the three synoptic gospels, uh, they share this same story, but a few different details, and we'll look at those just a little bit. For instance, in this story, we come face to face with what Luke calls a certain ruler. A certain ruler asked Jesus. But Matthew says that this man was young. He identifies him as a young man. He doesn't say how young, but he's a young man. We know he's more than 13 because he talks about ever since his youth, he's kept these commandments. And so that would indicate he was over 13 years old. Mark also says that this young ruler, this rich young ruler, because they all identify him as being a rich person, he says that this rich young ruler ran up to Jesus, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, Luke, of course, says that he's a ruler. Matthew, uh, when Jesus gives this list of commandments that the young man should follow, Matthew adds a commandment that says that is quoting from uh, Leviticus 19, 18, that says, you should love your neighbor as yourself. And he also, Matthew also includes this question that the young man asks after those commandments are listed. He says, what thing do I still lack? Let's read this scripture. Uh, Luke 18, starting in verse 18. Now a certain ruler asked him, Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, 
Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. The man replied, I have wholeheartedly obeyed all these laws since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was extremely wealthy. When Jesus noticed this, he said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this then said, Then who can be saved? He replied, What is impossible for mere humans is possible for God. And Peter said, Look, we've left everything we own to follow you. Then Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, there is no one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of God's kingdom, who will not receive many times more in this age, and in the age to come, eternal life. Now, <coughs> the Jewish people had this concept of the age to come. They believed that the, the time that they were living in uh, that was kind of um, marked by the effects of sin, that someday there would be a delineation or a dividing point and there would be a new age, an age to come, an age in which um, God's reign and God's rule would be made manifest on this earth. Jesus preached about it. We talked about it for a few weeks called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And it's God's kingdom here on earth. It's God's reigning and ruling on this earth that the Jewish people were looking forward to, and we do as well. We believe that that began to be ushered in during the life and times and ministry of Christ, and especially with his death and resurrection and ascension into heaven, that his kingdom was established here on this earth, and that it's not yet fully here, it's not yet fully realized. The full effects of his reign have not been made manifest until he returns once again. At that time, heaven will meet earth in a new way as the new heavens and the new earth come meeting down to this creation that God has made. And this, this guy, this young ruler, this rich young ruler, wanted in on that life. He wanted to be a part of what was to come. He wanted a piece of that. Perhaps he even wanted to experience it now. In fact, Jesus talked as if that was possible. And he, he talked to this man as if it could be attained by him, as if he had every possibility, every chance of being part of that kingdom life or that eternal life starting right now. That young man had this desire. He came to Jesus with this desire. But it turns out there was something that he had a stronger desire for. But we have that same desire too, don't we? We have that same desire to, to see evil banished, to see God's goodness replace it here on this earth. We have that desire to see the kingdom of God uh, overrunning all of the kingdoms of this world. Every day I turn on the news. I, 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 well, I shouldn't say that. I don't turn on the news. Every day that I happen to be in a place where somebody else has the news on and I'm forced to swallow some of that garbage, I, I, tend, to, uh, I tend to long for God's kingdom and his reign and his rule to be among us. All the more quickly and I want to work to see that actualized in our community I want to work to see our uh, our community our town our, our area of Zephyr Hills changed to, to be molded and shaped by the grace of God so that people would no longer live the way that they're living now that are living lives of hopelessness lives that are messed up and changed and distorted by sin but lives that are are made full and abundant life by Jesus Christ. We have the desire for that life, much like this rich young ruler did. We have the desire to sneak into it at times, too. See, I do funerals sometimes. I'll, I'll do a funeral for someone who uh, perhaps wasn't a believer or a follower of Jesus Christ, and yet I've heard their families say, well, they're in a better place now. They're in heaven. They're, they never say, oh, they went to be with Jesus. Oh, they got the rewards for the life they lived. They got the, the heavenly reward because Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant. They never say that. They just say, well, she's in heaven now. He's in heaven now. And, and that platitude makes us feel good inside. And I believe that that young man wanted that and we want that. 
And so he begins his conversation with Jesus by acknowledging good and bad. And he recognizes that maybe perhaps unlike many of the teachers of their day, that Jesus was a good teacher. And so he, he butters him up just a little bit. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Your translation might say, what must I do to be saved? You see, he wanted that and he wanted to find out from Jesus. And this was perhaps a, a, a common question for rabbis, for Pharisees, for uh, the, the sect called the Essenes. They would all have this discussion among themselves about what it took to achieve or inherit eternal life. But Jesus, before answering that, he immediately addresses one thing first. You see, this young man said, good teacher, what must I do? And Jesus stops him and he says, why do you call me good? There's one who is good, and that's our Father who is in heaven. He's the only one that's good. Jesus immediately took whatever praise that was received to him and deflected and reflected that up to the Father. You know, that's our job as well. See, we are created in God's image. We are created to be his statue, the image that represents him. And it's our job to, 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 to take the, whatever glory we can find on this earth and reflect that to God. It's our job to take whatever praise, whatever admiration happens and reflect that to God. Now, some people have done that with false humility. You'll clap for them after they perform in some way and they'll say, oh, no, it's all him. You know, they'll do that, and maybe sometimes they mean it, and maybe sometimes they don't, and I can't be the judge of whether that is, but by all means, if you're being humble, truly be humble, and don't just act like you are. Jesus, though, he proceeds to answer this question, this common enough question that they would have in their discussions, what does it take to enter into eternal life? He answered this, did you notice he quotes from the Ten Commandments? He sums them up very briefly for each one, in the second half of the commandments, he mentions these five. Don't commit adultery. Actually, don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. It's like the, the last five of the commandments. And, and he mentions those. Um, he leaves out don't covet, which is interesting. But he mentions these commandments. And, and as he's talking about them, uh, he, he mentions the ones that have to do with your relationship to other other humans, other people. As he's talking about them, he doesn't mention the first group, the first five that talk about your relationship to God. He talks about these. It makes you kind of wonder, he skipped the ones about our divine devotion and talks about the ones that are about our human interactions. Maybe perhaps he did that because the man was already um, coming to Jesus with a heart for for holiness, it seems, and so perhaps that's why Jesus skipped over those. But he he was the, the man answers. He says, "I've been devout in these things. I've I've kept these commandments. I've fulfilled these commandments ever since I was a little boy." In other words, from the time a, a Jewish boy turned thirteen years old, from then on, it was considered that he was mature and responsible to make his own decisions and commitments as far as his religious and spiritual life. And so from the time he was uh, entrusted with his own spiritual guidance and direction in his life, remember we talked a few months ago, by the way, that at 13, uh, a young boy might, if he wanted to follow a rabbi and be a disciple or a Talmud of that rabbi, he might start looking up rabbis and, and starting to kind of understand them and research them a little bit and to decide which one he might align with in his beliefs and his living and which one he might want to follow or become a disciple of. And maybe by as soon as 15, if he was good enough to be that rabbi's Talmud, that rabbi's disciple, he might ask, may I follow you? So this rich young ruler is not a disciple of anyone yet, and, and, and at the same time, he's taken his own responsibility, and, and then from the time he was 13 on, he says, I have followed these commandments. I've been devout in them. I've kept up with them. I have done what the law commanded me to do. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, he adds a line here that Luke doesn't add. The young man says, uh, what else am I missing? Is there something else that, that, that isn't present in my life? You see, I believe that this young man was having a moment of conscience where uh, he, 
whether it was the Holy Spirit or just his, his upbringing and his knowledge was speaking to him. And when he's face to face with Jesus Christ, the ultimate example of holiness and piety and law abiding and love and kindness and generosity and all the things that made up who Jesus was. As this young man is face to face with him, he senses that there's something else. Something besides observing these few commandments. And so he asked Jesus, according to Matthew, what else am I lacking? Now, I love what happens here. I love what's going on because um, th this man recognizes there's something missing. And, and I believe there's something that was, I don't want to say missing in God's law, but there's something that's not spelled out explicitly, but implied and provided for. You see, the law commanded on how to tithe. The law commanded things like uh, not charging interest or exorbitant interest called usury to your fellow Israelite. The law provided for the poor among the land by telling the landowners when their harvesters would come through that if they dropped some, uh, you know, some of the stalks or sheaves of grain on the ground that they wouldn't go back and pick them up and that they wouldn't mow to the edges of the field, that they would leave some grain standing so that the poor in the land would have food to eat, but they had to go work for it and gather it and bring it home. The law provided several things or commanded several things when it comes to how to care for others, but there was never a law that just simply said, be generous, give your money away. There was never a law that explicitly said that. It commanded the, the scriptures, the law commanded them to take care of the poor in the land, but that was it. Once you've met their basic human needs or basic daily needs, there was no commandment beyond that. But I think this man understood that there was something going on and he just wasn't quite ready to admit it yet. The law hinted at it and provided for it, and Jesus touches in on this one thing. And, and in doing so, Jesus showed that our salvation is not just one and done. There's not just you pray to prayer and you're good to go. In fact, the Church of the Nazarene emphasizes holy living. And in the, in the, the, the pathway to becoming holy, we understand that we're not there yet, but we are growing and we're getting there. And so this pathway to holiness is important. And Jesus shows that there should be progressive growth in our lives, that we should be growing, that we should be turning more and more like Christ. And so he begins to reveal this to us more and more. He begins to show us more and more through his word, through conversations with him, where we have to grow. He eventually asked this man to do what he had asked of his 12 disciples that were following him. Sell everything. Get rid of everything. This man had enough that he would have had to have uh, taken time to sell it all, and then it would have taken time to give it to the poor. It's quite a commitment to do all that. And then, once he's done with that, to come and follow Jesus, to become his disciple, to do the thing that perhaps this man wasn't good enough to do under any other rabbi, and yet Jesus called him to come follow him. Mark adds one interesting thing to that as well. When Jesus looked at the man just before telling him to sell everything and give to the poor, Mark says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus looked into the very core of this man's being, into the things, through all the things that, that had their clutches into him on his wealth. And Jesus looks at him and he has love. He has compassion. He has this yearning for this man's heart. He loved the man. Now, I want to take notice here. Jesus didn't look at the crowd and say to everyone, Hey, you all, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. No, he singled in on this one man. He looked him in the eye. He loved him. And he says, you, young man, you, this one certain ruler, as Luke calls him, you take what you have sell it and give it to the poor and then come follow me jesus had different commands different things that he commanded some things for everyone things like for instance you know don't lust don't be hateful of people don't worry don't kill some of these things were spoken to everyone they were universally applicable to all people then there were some things where jesus only commanded certain people for instance he didn't command everyone everywhere to go preach the gospel although i do believe he gave that mandate to the church as he was 
initiating or initializing the church upon his ascension into heaven, I do believe that he called the entirety of the church to go declare the gospel or preach the gospel, proclaim the gospel. But as far as the, the calling to, to preach, to, to go out and, and go to the different towns and villages and proclaim the word, I believe there were a select few that he did that to. For instance, the 12 disciples, the 72 disciples that, that he had sent out, people like that he gave a specific direction to. There were some people that he did command them to sell everything. There were some people that he said were eunuchs. You know, a eunuch is someone who is celibate by choice or by somebody else's choice if you're in service to the king, perhaps. But a eunuch, was, you know, these Jesus said there are some people who are eunuchs by the call of God or by the choice of that person so that they can follow God more closely. He says, especially about eunuchs, he says, the one who can accept this teaching should. In other words, there are some things that Jesus will call some people to do, but not everyone to do. And he'll say, the one who can accept this should. I believe that's the calling here to this young man, as he is saying, I'm calling you to sell everything and give it to the poor and follow me. And if you can't accept that, you should accept that. But Jesus knows that the call to discipleship is, a, is one where we pay a steep price. The call to discipleship is he said, you know, there will be people who will leave behind Mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, parents, children for the sake of God's kingdom. I don't think Jesus, in fact, I know for sure that Jesus was not saying, hey, abandon your family. But he is also acknowledging that there will be some people who don't, uh, don't get married, who don't have kids. There will be people who leave the comfort of home with their, their father and mother and from the, the, the closeness of their brothers and sisters. And they will leave and go to another place, maybe like a missionary or a minister that goes to a different town. And they will do that for the sake of the kingdom of God. Those who can accept this should. And so as Jesus is talking about all these things, the man goes away sad. He leaves without making the commitment to follow Jesus. Jesus, perhaps as the man is still within earshot, leaving, I believe very mournfully or sadly so, Jesus says, It's difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's not an easy thing for a wealthy person to enter into the kingdom. And the disciples say, If that's true, then who can be saved? How can anyone possibly enter into heaven, into eternal life? That was the disciples' big question. But for me, for us today, the real big question is this. What is keeping you from true eternal life in this age now and in the age to come? What is the thing or what are the things that are, that are a wall or a barrier that prevent you from really fully realizing eternal life, both now and in the age to come? You see, this passage, this, this story, this encounter with Jesus, this personal encounter that this man had with Jesus, it's about eternal life. I mean, isn't that what the young man asked about? It's about the pathway to eternal life. It's about how do we get there? How do we walk the path of eternal life? It's about the, the sacrifices that we make to be there, and it's about the rewards that we receive for walking that path. We have to understand when God grants eternal life, we, we have to trust him and walk obediently in it. But we also have to be aware that there can be things along the way that, that we're refusing to let go of. There's things along the way that we clutch to so tightly that we refuse to get rid of that, that those things can, can keep us from experiencing eternal joy. What are the things that are keeping you from that? What are the, the items or the, the possessions or the relationships even that you're holding on to that you won't let go of? What are the things that you're placing above your commitment to God that are keeping you from realizing the life that God has for you? You see, in truth, this young man's possessions were actually possessing him. These things that he thought he had ownership of, his his money, his finances, his business holdings, those things that he thought he owned, in turn, it turns out that they owned him. Perhaps even Satan owned him. 
despite this man's faithful observance of the commandments, despite the fact that this man, for in his heart, had this this full longing to 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 obey the commands, to fulfill them, to live by them, to live them out. Even though his heart had that desire and he kept them since he was a young boy, it seems to be that they did not possess him. That he didn't receive the gift of life that was promised in the commandments because he was relying on something else. You see, I wonder if Jesus didn't mention the first five commandments when he was mentioning the list of things for the man to obey. I wonder if he didn't list those first five because they were really the ones that the man struggled with the most. I mean, what are the first few commandments? God says to the Israelites, he says, I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of Egypt. I am your God. Don't have any other gods before me or around me in my presence. Don't bring another God into my presence. God also then goes on to say, don't carve an idol or make a graven image. Don't, don't, uh, don't cast an idol for yourselves. Don't carry my name in vain. You know, we always talk as if uh, taking the Lord's name in vain means some type of um, curse word type of thing. When really to carry the Lord's name in vain is really like saying carry God's name well. Don't carry it for purposes of vanity or for self. Don't, don't try to stamp the Lord's name on top of my life and my business as if somehow that makes it all okay or will somehow bless me. Don't try to look at your success and say, see, praise to God for my success because, uh, because this is God's stamp of his, his goodness upon my life. Don't try to, don't try to, if, if God has blessed you, that's great. But if you're just trying to take God's name and stamp it to your successes that you've been worshiping and pining after for so long, don't vainly put God's name on that. Honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. These first five commandments, I wonder if perhaps those were the things the man struggled with the most. And that's why Jesus didn't touch on them. He lobbed a softball to the guy at first. He says, Oh, you know the commandments. You know what to do. Don't murder. Guy's like, I'm good. Don't commit adultery. Hey, I'm okay with that. I love my spouse. You know, don't steal. Hey, I've got enough money. I don't need to steal. You know, Jesus starts listing all those things. You know, honor your father and mother. Well, of course, he's going to honor his father and mother. He probably inherited most of his wealth from them. Uh, give, don't give false testimony. Why would you need to lie about anybody if you're running a business with integrity? Those are easy ones. Jesus lobbed him a softball. But the ones about your devotion to God, about don't carve an extra you know, an image out of something and worship that as an, as an additional God, you know, don't use God's name for vain purposes, for your own self purposes. Those are the things that this man struggled with, it seems. So I wonder what possesses you. You see, the goal of the commandments is to say that you belong to God. That from the beginning, God created us to be in relationship with him, and we are his, and he loves us, and he loves you, and he loved this young man. But something else can possess you if you allow it to. What are the things that you've treasured on earth that you think are enriching your life or building your life up now, but they're actually pulling you away from the kingdom of heaven? You've got things that you think are building you up, but in the end, they're actually tearing you down and, and removing your joy, both in this life and in the life to come. When Jesus talked about this, Peter joyfully responds to him and he says, Look, Lord, we, those, you know, these disciples along here with me, we have left everything to follow you. We've left everything behind to follow you. I, if I used to read that thinking that Peter was somehow being like proud or haughty or, or maybe even just a little bit like looking for a compliment from Jesus. I used to read it that way, but then I recognized when we see this young man going away sad because he can't give up on his wealth, he can't give up on his possessions, he can't get rid of the things that own him, Peter's saying, we don't have that baggage. These guys up here with me that are following you, we got rid of that baggage. We don't have that anymore. We're just following you. Lord is great. Jesus responds to Peter that you'll be rewarded both in this life and eternally. So I wonder, just like the young man asked Jesus, what is it that you still lack? What good thing do you lack in serving Christ? 
Or what do you lack in repentance? In other words, what do you need to shed off of yourself? Some type of sinful behavior, an ongoing sin that you're committing, some type of attitude that you have, uh, something that keeps you from obtaining and enjoying eternal life, both now and in the world to come. I want to actually close out something I've never really done on these videos. I want to close out with another video that somebody did a whole lot better than I could. So here, enjoy this. Oh yeah. No, I heard what he said. I heard all too well what Jesus told that man, that, that thief that he was hanging next to. And you know what? It was drastically different than what he told me. You see, the day that I encountered Jesus, I dropped to my knees right in front of him. He had my respect from the start. You see, I wasn't looking for a handout, okay? I explained to him that I had done the hard work. I just needed to know, was there something that I was missing? Was there, was there some good thing that I needed to do in order to inherit eternal life? And you know, sell all that you own. That's what Jesus told me. Sell it all, and you'll have treasure in heaven. <laughs> yeah, right. You see, I was always taught that salvation is a reward for a life that is filled with good works. It is not a handout that you give to people that can't muster up, up that can't muster up enough character to earn it themselves. My wealth is a clear indication of the favor that rests upon me from God. I had asked about eternal life, and this, this disgusting shell of a man, he's the one that gets it? Jesus told him the day he died, he would be in paradise. This man couldn't bleed a drop of goodness that he hadn't borrowed. No, no, that he hadn't stolen from the righteous man that he's hanging next to. He was a thief, and I'm the one that is treated like I've been robbing God all along. I offered to do what I needed to do. This man offered nothing. All he could do was ask for mercy, and, and that's how he got salvation. That's how he got eternal life. It was just, it was just given to him. Like, like it was a, a gift. <laughs> 